Bullock. There were escalations in the eastern direction, from Crimea along the Crimean Isthmus, and from the north, Kyiv region, Chernihiv region, Sumer region. The Minister of Internal Affairs was the first to call Volodymyr Zelensky and say the war has begun. At about 4 a.m. from my deputy, who came into the office and said that he was informed that our checkpoints were being shelled with heavy weapons, mortars and so on. I made a call to the Chernobyl zone, directly to the commander who was there. He confirmed this information, saying that there was a battle going on, that we were being shot at with heavy weapons, that a war has begun. I was asleep and I received a phone call that the war had begun. You know, boxers say that there is a fight strategy before the first blow, then everything is based on skills. So the plan was on paper, but it was different from what really needs to be done, and we had to adapt very quickly to the ongoing situation. At 5 a.m. I heard explosions. A plane flew over the house. At 6.15 we were already at work. I started calling and saying, friends, take your weapons, let's get together near the executive committee building. I would not say that the presidential office staff was shocked or, for example, the president himself. The world was shocked, this is obvious. Just in a few minutes after we saw what was going on at our borders, he was already making specific decisions about what to do and how to do it, where to get information. The meeting of the National Security and Defense Council was held immediately, and it was an immediate attempt to reorganize the state on a war footing. On the morning of February 24th, I was the second one to come to the president's office. Denis Monastirsky was the first. It was already 5.15, 5.20 when the first meeting of the National Security and Defense Council was held. We had all the documents prepared. We had to vote, we had to adopt the country's defense plan, which, by the way, was the first one in the history of Ukraine to be adopted as is. We had to adopt general mobilization and martial law. By 6 a.m. this was done, and members of the National Security and Defense Council gathered in the president's office. Dear citizens of Ukraine, many Ukrainian cities and towns heard the explosions. We are imposing martial law throughout the territory of our state. Please do not panic. We are strong, we are ready for anything. We will win, because we are Ukraine. Glory to Ukraine. They started receiving tons of information on the first day, what they wanted to have. It was about the whole left bank part of Ukraine. They wanted Kyiv. The situation was very, very critical. I remember very clearly that the first call the president made was to Boris Johnson at 6.04 a.m. It was a symbolic call, and the way Boris supported our country, our president, was crucial. For eight years, for an infinitely long eight years, we have been doing everything possible to resolve the situation by peaceful political means, all in vain. It was impossible to watch what was happening there without compassion. It was simply impossible to tolerate. This nightmare had to be stopped immediately. A genocide against the millions of people living there who were hoping for Russia, hoping only for you and me. This recording was an outpouring of aggression, anger and hatred towards Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. We saw it in the Russian president's facial expressions, in the way he presented it. It was obvious that he hates. He spoke with absolute aggression and anger. Circumstances require decisive and immediate actions. The People's Republics of Donbass have asked us for help. 
I decided to launch a special military operation. And for this, we will seek to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. We do not aim to occupy the Ukrainian territories. We are not going to impose anything on anyone by force. Six fifty air raid alert. It has begun. Missiles are flying all over the towns and cities. The Air Force was the first to receive the strikes. These are command and control centers, military airfields and anti-craft missile units, radar engineering forces. How many missiles were there? There were hundreds of them. They were of different types. They must have been Kinjals, Daggers, Iskanders, X-101 cruise missiles and so on. They needed to take over the sky. Whoever has the keys to the sky has full advantage on the ground. They managed to hit the targets because it was a truly massive attack. No country in the world has ever experienced anything like this. The plan of Russian military units was obvious, to make a breakthrough to the airfield, gain a foothold, and then receive large military cargo aircraft with personal equipment, supplies, fuel and oil, etc. We met them in a way that their two helicopters were shot down with means we had at that point. Two were forced to land and up to one company of paratroopers was destroyed. The enemy was shelled. During shelling, the runway was damaged. The Il-76 was one of the first approaching the airfield, was forced to turn around and go to Belarus. I remember that day well. They started to scatter. Our police squads were there, detained everyone, took the wounded to the hospital, and in the hospital we found out that we had detained 15 Russian Special Forces soldiers. It was the destruction of the elite of Russian army, which was entrusted with the main function of storming Kyiv. All those Kaluns, they were moving so calmly because they were sure that the bridgehead had already been prepared for them, that it was the gate to Kyiv, that it would already be open. The capital was not occupied, and this is a key event. They didn't hit all airfields. You know, I would not be surprised if they had such an idiotic plan, an idiotic idea that we would not hit Burispol. Why? Well, they thought that at that point, all our government officials, the so-called elite and so on, would grab money, run to the airport, get on the planes and fly out of the country. They really wanted this. In fact, they thought that there would be an administration vacuum here and they would parade march in Kiev and change the government in three days. Well, nothing like this happened. No one flew anywhere. No one escaped. They were met in all directions. They were not prepared for a filigree work of our artillery. You must have seen a video when in the center of Bucha or Brovary, right in the center, a column of armored vehicles is destroyed with no harm to the urban development. And this is even though we didn't have any HIMARS back then, or even any other high-precision weapons. The head of the state border guard service received the well-known message about the Russian warship. And you know, this mem went viral immediately. 
Then General Daineko printed out what was written there and put it on the wall in his office. When it happened, I had the feeling that somehow God gave a sign that we would eventually send them right to that place where that young guy let them go. By the way, it was an advice from his older comrade. We have the original sources. He asks an elderly person what to do. And this man says to him, well, to tell him, and he did. Anyone who has combat experience and can join the defense of Ukraine should immediately arrive to the appropriate recruitment centers. On the first day, even before the mobilization was announced, before martial law was imposed, there were already queues at military registration and enlistment offices. The first wave of people who went to war were volunteers, people who went to the military registration and enlistment offices themselves, not mobilized. There were long lines, and while everyone was hearing the explosions, I realized that no one was going to stay at home and help as much as they could. We are already giving out guns, and we'll keep giving them out to defend our land to all those who are willing and able to defend our sovereignty. I think it was a great decision that allowed us to stabilize the situation in the capital. There was a queue in the entrance to the main office. I went outside and one, two hundred people were standing there. And we kept giving guns to them and more than 30,000 automatic weapons were issued. And people took them and went to checkpoints. Moreover, we registered more than 3,500 trophy weapons. That is, those captured from Russians. People came and consciously gave them away. This is a very interesting psychological and sociological case, which shows that at a particular time, in a particular place, a stratum gathered, a stratum in a sociological sense, which is able to receive weapons and not turn them on its own state. We repeat every day. Close the sky over Ukraine. Close it to all Russian missiles, to Russian combat aviation, to all these terrorists. Create a humanitarian air zone, no missiles, no bombs. This call has become loud all over the world and shocking. How can we close the sky over Ukraine if Russia has already closed the sky over Ukraine? We saw those announcements as they are called to close the sky is to send planes, roughly speaking, and they were supposed to shoot down everything flying in the air. And Russian aviation was flying in the air. What is this? This is clear, at least the Third World War. We closed the sky on our own. I repeated this many times when it happened, because Russian aircrafts stopped flying into the territory controlled by Ukraine. <laughs> Collective symbol of our aviation was born after a few successful actions by the Ukrainian aviation, while the enemy thought he had destroyed it. During one of the brainstorming sessions, we were thinking how to name it, because everyone thought it was a certain pilot. And during the discussion, we came up with the Ghost of Kiev. After that, it went viral and started existing independently. Pilots in the skies of Kyiv region did wonders. Even during the Second World War this happened. Nowadays they don't fight like that. Whoever saw someone first just launch a missile and that's it. But we did see this happening here. That's why we wrote like this. First it was called an Avenger. Then it became boring. Well, Ghost commands from social network. And we followed the idea. Once written, look what this guy is doing. Well, I wrote this myself to the Air Force Command. It was enough. It means he exists. It was essential for such a unity. Everyone was feeling proud.
I think, well, it should be said that this is a collective image that pilots of the 40th Tactical Aviation Brigade from Vasil Kiev are ghosts. Occupation became possible because of the overwhelming number of troops and equipment. There were more than a thousand units. They were coming from different directions. You know, the number of troops far exceeded our capabilities. This is when you ask a policeman from Borodyanka how the situation in Borodyanka is, and he says, there is no Borodyanka anymore. You know how it feels to hear this? And in Makarov, I could get in touch with them once a day. When they would go up to the high-rise buildings where there was a connection. And you can't believe that this is happening in Kyiv region, where it was peaceful just two days ago. We have an exclusive video from the surveillance cameras at the car wash. This was the first battle when we burned the infantry fighting vehicle, when the infantry was shot there, and they realized that it would not be that easy to enter Irpin. We said we will stand up to the end for our city, and we are not going to surrender it to Russians. When Irpin was captured by 30%, we controlled 70% of the town. 30% was controlled by Russians. And they would drive onto those yards, people would come out, and if they didn't like someone, they would shoot them. They would take out the family. They would take the man and throw the woman and children into the basement. We don't know what happened to those guys. Rumors say they were planning to take some people to Belarus for an exchange. They drove over those bodies intentionally to show disrespect for Ukrainians. I'm sorry, we then scrapped these corpses from the asphalt with shovels. Guys from my unit European in the territorial defense were killed. About 50 soldiers from the armed forces were killed. And more than 300 people were civilians, ordinary European residents. The local population moved from all the upper floors to the basement, even among the high-rise buildings. Each yard had its own so-called bathroom, used by people who stayed in town. It was their own sanitary zone. And they are still there. The war is not over yet. The destruction was about 70%. In the village of Yehidne, Chernihiv region, almost 300 people were kept for about 30 days in a 100 square meter basement with children. People couldn't even lie down. They had to sit and stand all the time, because there were not enough space for all of them. Apparently, they destroyed Mria. Russians did it on purpose, because Mria is the most famous plane in the world, and it was the Ukrainian pride. And they would never have left it behind. On the Russian side, they, you know, Russian tried to be very polite. We are ready to meet you, to talk, we are ready. Call those who haven't given up yet, send them over. This is Russia. On the other hand, we had our own goals. We wanted to go to show that we understand the nature of this war. We don't understand why you think we can surrender. We had to show it. This is psychology. Withdraw your troops. 
and this was President Zelensky's proposal on February 23rd, 24th. Just withdraw, and then we can talk. We can talk like that, right? And then stop shelling our territory. It is clear that Russia didn't want all this, because it was February 28th. And at that moment, Russia sincerely believed that not three days, but two weeks would be enough. There was definitely no one to fight with, because they believed that there were 5,000. They said it so frankly, you have 5,000 Nazis, we'll kill them quickly. Russia's condition was capitulation, territorial concessions by Ukraine. This was the recognition of Crimea's status as Russia's, one of the main conditions. Ukraine had to give up the Autonomous Republic of Crimea plus the status of the so-called Lugansk and Donetsk People's Republics. These were the primary objectives of the Russian Federation. Then the appetite for recognition of the occupied territories of Zaporizhia and Kherson regions began to grow. The position of the Ukrainian side was clear. Logical to delay time when the necessary period of time to get a diplomatic support from Western countries and, most importantly, military technical support. As practice has shown, this scenario was quite successful. Those were not negotiations, but a demonstration of Ukraine's position. Ukraine was looked at in a completely different way. And this thesis that nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine has become a given. Губернатор жив, зам губернатора жив, все живы. Деремся дальше. Харьков. Удар крылатой ракеты. A cruise missile strike on the largest square in Europe. To the Svoboda Square. Dozens of victims. This is the terrorism against Kharkiv. Terrorism against Ukraine. There was no military target in the square. This is what is called fire on headquarters. If Russians say they have suffered some kind of defeat somewhere, they have been kicked in the teeth somewhere, then they say they need to hit the control centers. The situation in Kharkiv was similar. When they failed to occupy Kharkiv from the east, when they were not met with flowers, but on the contrary they were met with fire, then they started shelling the city, hit the city center. They thought that we would eliminate those who were leading the defense of Kharkiv, and then it would be easier to occupy the city. Protection of Russians in Ukraine. But in fact, they are destroying those cities where the Russian-speaking population live. And Mariupol is one of the clear indicators. The most powerful filtering of people was primarily in Mariupol. Arrests, detentions, checks. They have Nikolai Stadikov, who develop a theory that Russia should fight against the countries of the sea and it should capture all the exit points to the sea. And this is the Black Sea, the Sea of Azov, etc. And even recently Putin has boasted that they have completely occupied the Sea of Azov, which is now the internal sea of the Russian Federation, according to him. The threat Kherson region is about control over the Kakhovka hydroelectric power plant. This means water supply and, accordingly, so-called dry corridor. That is the route that connects the territories of Crimea with the occupied territories of Lugansk and Donetsk regions. All the attempts of the Russian Federation to solve the issue of water supply to Crimea by desalination, water extraction from the bottom of the Sea of Azov, they were firstly extremely corrupt, secondly quite costly and thirdly ineffective. The second reason why they were going through Kherson was again, in my opinion, the second goal was to control the Zaporizhia NPP. This is the uninterrupted power supply to the occupied Crimea. 
and all the stories about the effectiveness of the so-called energy bridge that connected the regions of the Russian Federation with the occupied Crimea. I again, not true. They believed that historically the South had a genetic pool different from the West of Ukraine because of the changes that took place there often. They believed that the percentage of support for Russia in the South was higher than, let's say, Donetsk area, or higher than in the center or in the West of Ukraine. So I think that is why they thought they would be welcomed. From other point of view, from the geopolitical point of view, I think the smart thing for the invaders to do was to cut Ukraine off from the Black Sea and the passage to Transnistria. It was an attempt to blackmail both Ukraine and the international community with nuclear weapons. Not only did they deploy troops and weapons there, which is strictly prohibited, it is a risk of disaster. They provoked various extreme situations, including blackouts, disruption of normal operation. And they also started blaming Ukraine for the shelling. At the same time, they fired at Ukrainian positions across the Dnipro just from the territory of the Zaporizhia NPP. We experienced tonight that could have altered the history. The history of Ukraine, the history of Europe. Russian cities attacked the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, the largest in Europe itself. It could equal to having six Chernobyls. Russian tanks knew what they were shooting at. A direct hit on the plant is terror of an unprecedented level. Russian people, I want to address to you. Radiation does not know where Russia is. Radiation does not know where the borders of your country are. When it all started, the IAEA and other international organizations were involved. Efforts are still ongoing to neutralize those risks. A whole team went there, 14 of us from the International Atomic Energy Agency. We saw the military actions around Zaporozhye NPP. I saw with my own eyes the remains of shells on the building. The physical integrity of the facilities has been violated repeatedly. The statistics show that about 85% of all missile and bomb attacks by Russian troops were aimed at civilian objects. These are school, hospitals, municipal institutions or authorities like regional state administrations or local authorities. These are just civilian houses, houses of ordinary people, where people live. They decided that everything should be destroyed, and then, in fact, ground troops were ongoing to enter on these ruins. That is massive airstrikes, bombing strikes, FA bombs, which are extremely destructive. There is nothing sacred about them. Victory at any price. For 100 years and since the Second World War in the Soviet Union times, he cannot boast of a single military operation that could be or would be included in the books of military operations, which could be used to train military personnel. It must be so open, so cynical and so cruel. Here, the refugees were hiding in the drama theater. A woman and a man lie on the ground during the explosions and command, here is the Russian world. 
The Russian Federation deliberately went for many deaths. They had to break the spirit of resistance among Mariupol residents. Not only the civilian population, but also the military personnel. Because the civilian population was supposed to put pressure on the military to make the armed conflict end. Many victims, you are to blame for the fact that we are dying. This is the logic of the Russian occupiers. And what is happening now in Mariupol is that they are dismantling, in fact, the crime scene has already been destroyed to prevent us from obtaining a certain evidence base. There was artillery shelling when civilians waiting for bread were simply killed. Those footage went global and everyone got to see the real Russian world, what it will be like. This is death and ruin, and it brings nothing better. This, by the way, was the best answer to the Russian Federation. Because they hoped that sooner or later the entire energy infrastructure of Ukraine would collapse. But when this happened officially, Ukraine at least received guarantees that in the event of a very critical situation, we will receive support, including from the countries of the European Union. Which, by the way, happened after Russia started hitting critical infrastructure. The exchange that we had before Ukraine gave, Ukraine received something, it became official after March 16th. In fact, this has brought us even closer to integration with the European Union. Well, this is very important when there is such a unified energy infrastructure, and on the other hand, it made us completely independent from Russia. No country in the world can be prepared for such a scale, that is, neither the United States nor Germany. Problems with evacuation began with Irpin, because by then the bridge was blown up and intensive battles took place. Zhitomir Highway was blocked off. We did everything we could, and even on boats crossing the Kiev Sea, there are tragic facts when people died and drowned during the storm. If we are talking about our city, it is a 100,000 city. We managed to evacuate out 95% of all residents. I had a reception day and a woman came just to say hello and show her child. A small child of six months. And she says, Alexander Grigorievich, you probably don't remember me at the station. I was pregnant, you helped me get on the train. I just wanted to show my child and say that we are alive and well. You know, it is so touching that we help them and the person just came to say hello. Ukrzaliznitsia, which we have traditionally criticized for many things, they simply demonstrated miracles. Despite the shelling and the whole bunch of problems, they worked and took people out. I think that Ukrzaliznitsia is one of the heroic pages of the home front work. On the very first day, we launched the Prihistok Shelters project. The idea was that if you can offer an accommodation to those who are being evacuated, at least for a day or two, so that people can wash there, stop there and so on, and we were simply amazed. Thousands of apartments, tens of thousands in a day. We were just shocked by the scale. To be clear, this site was used by a million people. A historical event, they failed to take Kyiv in three days. I remember how our guys were the first to enter Bucha and saw the Russians leaving by car. We captured that car. And then we looked at what was stolen there. The washing machines, TVs, well, whatever. We're driving. There are debris everywhere, a lot of broken Russian equipment, and people are standing in the gate. I open the window and shout, glory to Ukraine! They don't understand, they look with fear in their eyes, they don't understand who it is. And I say, take out the flag! And so we drove. 
We took this flag out of the window and people started running after us. Just running. You can't imagine it. It's such a feeling. I even wanted to cry with joy. They left us death. They left booby-trapped playgrounds in children's toys. They, we have a lot of photos where there is a grenade in a children's toy. Witness is told that a certain woman was raped during the filtration period. Either a woman told herself or the journalist reported. There are different cases, you know. There's a woman whose man was killed for defending. I mean, the Brovary district. They killed her dog, destroyed her house. She was threatened that her three-year-old child would be killed if she resisted. I have several servicemen whose parents were simply shot and buried in a common grave. On the 10th day after the deoccupation or something like that, a soldier found his father in one of these graves. To date, we have already found 1,368 bodies of our dead citizens, civilians, I emphasize. 38 of them are children. Plus, we have 300 people who are still considered missing during active hostilities in the Kyiv region. Of the bodies already exhumed, 198 bodies remain unidentified. Such an attitude towards the population of the occupied territory is inherent in the Russian army. Among the recent examples are the First and the Second Chechen War. A huge number of civilians were killed by Russians. Moreover, a significant part of the population of Grozny, which was twice wiped off the map, were Russians. The Soviet army behaved in the same way in Afghanistan. The Soviet army lost 16,000 people and the losses of the Afghans exceeded 1 million. The Soviet army did the same in Germany at the end of World War II when all women were simply raped. Because the aggression was just looking for a way out and the army leadership allowed such things to happen. In other words, it is a cultural tradition. Unfortunately, that's the thing that we are facing. There were also quite powerful battles. The enemy was exhausted there. That is, they could not approach. In addition, quite serious logistical gaps have begun. We saw, especially in the Chernigov direction, how much equipment was left, which was abandoned as a result of running out of fuel and so on. And all these, of course, was due to the successful actions of the Ukrainian military, who made the enemy understand the futility of their attacks, and they decided to retreat. For some reason, the Russians were sure that they could just walk through and no one would meet them there. And they really went through the whole region, but they could not go back. The Russians themselves realized that they were in another country. Fortunately, there are no occupied settlements. The Russians have withdrawn most of their equipment, armored vehicles, artillery out of the Suma region. They left all northern regions of the country for two reasons. Firstly, they no longer had enough resources, and secondly, the Ukrainian armed forces began to conduct more effective offensive operations. Therefore, it would be correct to say that they did not leave these areas, but escaped. We are talking about a planned action. They needed picture with a large number of victims. At the same time, the Russian Federation itself denied this. But nevertheless, the results of the missile strike created artificial chaos in the territories controlled by the armed forces of Ukraine. This undermines not only the morale of the population, but also the military personnel of the armed forces of Ukraine. Unfortunately, Putin has a penchant for historical parallels. This is blanket bombing of German cities by the Allied Air Forces. Accordingly, it was the tactic he used one-on-one -on -one in Ukraine, attacks against civilian infrastructure.
Madame President, you're welcome. You... To perbuvaiche v Buchi. Being in Bucha and seeing what happened with my own eyes, I can say that our humanity faced a challenge in Bucha. This is a challenge to the entire world community. We are on your side. We stand shoulder to shoulder with you. When Mrs. von der Leyen, who has the European Commission, other leaders, Mr. Michel, Mr. Borrell, arrived at Kyiv, now this is the fourth visit. Well, coming to Kyiv, visiting Bucha, Europeans seeing the war with their own eyes, it radically changed their attitude towards Ukraine. They became friends of Ukraine. Boris Johnson's visit in April was a huge historical event both for Ukraine and Britain. It was a very resonant thing that surprised the whole world about a week and a half before his arrival. The Russian troops were right next to Kyiv. Of course, it was a big security issue in Britain. This was considered probably the most successful step in general for Boris Johnson's entire term as the prime minister. Boris Johnson's idol is Winston Churchill and he has always dreamed of becoming the new Churchill and he found his Hitler in Vladimir Putin. I can't even imagine how the state security service coped. I think many colonels turned grey because of this. But making such a demonstrative gesture is showing that I have full confidence in Ukraine. Ukraine will protect me from missiles. I express support for Ukraine and I'm not afraid to walk through the streets of a country at war. This is a signal to the entire Western coalition that it is possible to be brave. Of course, this will also be a historical episode in textbook. The flagship, that is the pride that went down. And it is important to understand that the well-known phrase about the Russian warship referred to the cruiser Moskva, because it was one of the two ships that sailed up to the Snake Island. The threat of nuclear war is real, at least according to Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. The risks are very significant. I really wouldn't want these risks to be artificially swelled, but there are a few who want to. The danger is serious, it is real, it should not be underestimated. It is well known where Russia got nuclear weapons. We had four countries on the territory of the USSR that had nuclear weapons. It was the Russian Federation, it was Kazakhstan, it was ours, and it was Belarus. When it was decided to give up all nuclear weapons and make the Russian Empire responsible for the entire territory of the USSR, it was their big mistake. Today we have the consequences of the transfer of these nuclear weapons to Russia that is currently blackmailing the whole world using our weapons. At that time this message was addressed to the West, so that the West would not transfer to Ukraine the M777 artillery systems and other bombardment artillery or self-propelled artillery that they began to transfer to us. At that time, a decision was being made to transfer artillery and other means to Ukraine. And this statement was solely for the West to be a friend and not give Ukraine weapons. The nuclear threat is frightening, of course. This makes us feel like a victim and forces us to be in the state, and this is not very good for our mental health. On the other hand, we see that when Putin launched this full-scale invasion, went to war against us, he went all in. He immediately laid these cards on the table and the only thing he has left that he hasn't used yet is nuclear weapons. 
застосував це ядерна зброя. Вход пішов і ядерний шантаж. Nuclear blackmail has also been unleashed. I would like to remind those resorting to such statements against Russia that our country also has various weapons of destruction. And some of our components are even more up to date than NATO member countries. When the territorial integrity of our country is threatened, we will obviously use all the means we have at all our disposal to protect Russia and our people. This is not a bluff. Anyone trying to blackmail us with nuclear weapons should know that the wind rose will turn in their direction as well. What else can Putin surprise us with after February 24th? Well, nothing else. And he cannot use nuclear weapons, he can only threaten. Saying that he is not a bluff, as he said. But by and large, he has already used everything, and we Ukrainians understand that he has already lost the war of intimidation. It was apparently not a political but more of a humanitarian image-building step, because on the one hand she arrived not in the status of an actress, but in the status of ambassador of the United Nations. You see, through such mechanism more and more people learned about Ukraine, about the war in Ukraine. Because I don't know how many followers she has on Instagram or Facebook, but I think there are a lot. It is clear that when she told about it there and posted it, the people who were not even interested in the war in Ukraine, they at least began to find out why she flew there. Then there were many other actors. Symbolic, silly thing. Yes, but, but I, if but I know, but if I know this is here with you. It seems to me that they did a very important thing, which sometimes, let's be honest, in terms of its consequences, effective consequences, exceeded what individual politicians, individual Western countries did. Well, we hope to get to Ukraine. There was an evacuation two times, and two times it failed. Because of the daily shelling, it was impossible to stick out your nose. To the motherland, home, although our motherland is here, but we are going far away from here. But in Ukraine, of course. Zaporizhia, they said. Excellent choice. Russia did not want us as the international community, as the United Nations, as the Red Cross, to see that it would not let civilians out of the city. Russia wants them to remain as a human shield. Despite all the troubles, despite everything, I want to say that this is a successful operation. We see people who are alive here, among us. Creating a certain moral climate when family members, including wives and children, have to put pressure on defenders to stop armed resistance. This is an internal opportunity for the United States. When they exhaust the resources allocated as non-reimbursable assistance to Ukraine to provide this assistance using other financing tools. And land lease is just about that. But it was an important symbolic decision in terms of demonstrating the willingness of the United States. Bayraktar, Harpoon, Heimars, Starling, Zheshov and, of course, land lease. It was a demonstration, finally, the first demonstration by the United States that these were no longer just statements that we would stand to the end. We very strongly condemn Russian aggression and so on. This was already strong support of the statement made by the United States that they would help Ukraine with all their might. This gave a signal to Russia that Ukraine will now be a country that will destroy the aggressor. We will have the resources to wage war against the aggressor. In the first Chechen war they used something similar. Well, they can't be used 
They do not have any safeguards in the form of the Geneva Convention's rules of international law, international humanitarian law or any moral obligations. They have ammunition and weapons and they have to use it. What consequences it causes, whether it is forbidden or not, that is the last thing they care about. The top military authority gave the order to preserve the life and health of garrison soldiers and stop the defense of the city. The only thing I can say is that the decision was absolutely correct when they surrendered in agreement with our leadership. Because at that time there were no prospects, for example, of conducting some kind of active defense. And fighting there to the last person would be a wrong story. Putin Putin always fights with symbols, because it is symbols that hold people together. That's why it was important for him to take not even Mariupol, but the Azov people. For them, Azov is a recognized extremist organization. They knew that the guys had become just a symbol of invincibility. It was the same with Donetsk airport, which did not solve any issues. Then there was an order to destroy it completely with a barrage fire because they are cyborgs. We make films about them. We talked about them all the time. And now we're talking about Azovstal. They forcibly deport children people who disagree with them are arrested or forcibly deported under the fellow citizen program. Somewhere in the middle of nowhere in Russia. But they demolish houses, I also saw it. They say that they built a lot, but in fact they built a little. They are building it for Russian mercenaries. They have now given the command to transfer to Sober, the Russian guard, and the occupiers' police departments there. And they announced double wages and relocation allowances for those families who will move to the temporarily occupied territory. They need a scorched field, and they will populate it with new citizens of the Russian Federation. In their so-called regulations, there is a term of property in abeyance. For example, they came, knocked, no one answered. They put up announcement that the owner should contact the administration about their property within a week. If the owner has not applied, then according to their rules, all property goes to the fund of property in abeyance and so they take it away. We can consider this date the beginning of real, not sectoral. Real economic sanctions against the Russian Federation Moreover, there is a reduction in the dependence of EU countries on Russian oil. In 2023, they will be forced to mothball a significant part of their oil fields, because they will simply have no one to sell this oil to. As of today, it is actually sold at the cost price. That is, they are not in the black with it. They are either close to zero or even in the red, because there are also transportation costs. And Russia could not find alternative markets for sales. Why? Because they simply do not exist in the world. India, China, which bought more oil at certain stage, still have their own ceiling, and they do not need more. And oil is not gas. As for gas, you can unscrew the value, ignite it, and it will just burn. By the way, this happens in many areas, and someone calculated that in one area, a million dollars were burned in this way in one day.
That's just because it's burning in the air there, and that's it. It won't work with oil fields. The oil is constantly pumping, and accordingly you should have something to store it in. And how does it work? You extracted it, loaded it, or it is stored in some containers, and then it poured from these containers into tanks, and the tanks are transported and sold. If they sell less, it remains in the tank. It cannot be taken anywhere. Accordingly, you need to close the field. In the shadow of war in Europe, the European Council adopted today a historical decision. It is granting the EU candidate status to Ukraine. You need to understand that for them, Europe has always been about borders of the so-called Roman Empire, Roman law. And all that comes next is not Europe for them, and it always has been. And this is a turning point in their consciousness that now this is also Europe. We have just received a candidacy. This is a victory. We waited 120 days and 30 years. Before the invasion, no one even promised us this candidate status. Even attempts to fix the membership perspective, this provoked denial from the European Union leaders. I would especially like to draw your attention to the fact that Zelensky and the state leadership submitted application for the EU membership in the very first days of the war. The enemy is near Kyiv. There is the risk of capturing Kyiv. I remember it was perceived as fantasy, saying that you need to save yourself and not think about membership. How did it that happen? It was a well-timed move, timely and appropriate. In less than two months, the enemy was pushed back from Kyiv, and in April the EU leaders come to us, and even then the discussion of this decision began. Why did that happen? Because the victories of Ukrainians on the battlefield, the heroism in battle, and in the rear, and the heroism of the president who became the most popular figure in the world, and this has inspired great respect for Ukraine.